So it's my great pleasure to introduce Mark Allen of LA's Machine Project. Um, I had the great privilege to visit uh, the Machine Project's um, home base in Echo Park in January of this year. I was struck by sort of interesting multi-level experience that the Machine Project could present. But more recently I saw Mark presenting some films and some performances um, at um, in Marfa for the festival, I can't remember Marfa Film Festival, Marfa Film Festival yeah. yeah, that's it. And um, basically what that, that sort of showed me that the, the extent of the machine project seems to sort of go beyond presenting but into curating and into presenting different kinds of work by different kinds of collaborators. But um, I won't go on any further because Mark will tell you about that, but um, I'd just like to say that the, the image that you left me with was the image of a trapdoor. Uh -huh. And um, I think the trapdoor feels to me symbolic of what you do somehow. Anyway, Mark Allen, the Machine Project. Thank you. I feel slightly self conscious for this microphone. You in the back, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. Comfortably? What about you? Okay. <laughs> Alright, I'm going to talk without the mic. Okay. Is that okay? Just yeah, sure, yeah. And I can just yell a little bit. Okay. Some can and some can't. Some can and some can't. Yeah. Talk with yeah. I feel like I'm karaoke and I'm terrible at karaoke. So. <laughs> uh, I'm going to give like the shortest of formal talks and then I'll show mostly a few videos and then I have this fantasy that it can be sort of conversational. But if it's not, I'll just show more videos and stare awkwardly at you. Is that all right? Okay, good. So um, just as a preamble, I wanted to um, have a plea for sympathy for the word art, because it's like this tiny word that's forced in our culture to do an immense amount of work in terms of what it's supposed to mean. And I would argue because of that, it's actually become somewhat useless. And so initiatives to broaden the definition of art are just making the situation worse. But to kind of review this, um, so we might use this to mean, you know, like our classical masterpieces of human culture. Um, we also use it to mean things made by like a culture that we have no knowledge or history of and no idea basically of why they were doing what they were doing. Um, we use it to describe the stuff you did as a kid that your parents <laughs> put on the refrigerator. Um, and of course, in a contemporary sense, we use it often for objects which are created primarily as like vehicles of global capital. Um, and we also use it to describe things like this action by Francis Elise where he got a thousand people to attempt to move a mountain um, using shovels. In the, to the general public, the word art also inherits this meaning that it had um, in earlier times, which is basically something which is really well made well-crafted, and so we get these bizarre manifestations like nail art, um, or a particularly abject example from America, which is the Subway Sandwich Company, refers to their employees who make the sandwiches as sandwich artists. So when they say this, they do not mean that they are working in a conceptual exploration of the cultural impacts of what a sandwich could mean, but they mean that they make their sandwich as well, which is probably arguable. Um, so, our, I, I'm interested in art, or using the word art, to basically represent the space in our culture that we think about ideas in, or that's like an open space for non-functionalized experimentation. Um, in Los Angeles, um, it's an interesting city with a lot of different things going on. And about 10 years ago, when I finished grad school, I found myself going to a lot of poetry readings, and it would just be like 11 poets who were there so other people would hear their poems. Or I'd go to scientific talks, and it was all scientists, or I'd go to art openings, and it was all art artists. And so I became interested in thinking about what was a really straightforward way to kind of develop a transdisciplinary conversation. So not even thinking about transdisciplinary work, but how do you have a conversation with a chef and an engineer about experimental music? And my basic theory was really straightforward. Do different events all the time and make them really friendly and have free beer, and then people will become confused and come to stuff they don't know about. 
So presumably, if you're a rocket scientist, you come to the rocket science talk because it's your area of interest. And then you have this impression in your mind, oh, that's that place where this interesting rocket science stuff, and all of a sudden you're at a poetry. So this was my theory. It actually proved to be oddly successful at doing that. Um, and I came up with this name with this idea that um, could a space be like a machine for generating ideas? So if you think about how like a museum functions or how a gallery functions, they're primarily sites of display of stuff that was made somewhere else. And so my thought was like, well, how could an architectural space and the people who work there and the sort of ideology and ideas be a mechanism for producing new ways of thinking about culture? So at the space, we do some things you might think of as sort of traditional installation art. Like we teleported a boat in there um, by this artist, Josh Beckman, um, where we did this project where we transformed the gallery into a forest. But primarily, um, I'm sort of, I'm primarily I'm concerned with actions, events, and workshops. So they might be things like this was a workshop for parents and children where they learned to break into cars, hotwire cars, and break out of the trunks of cars. Um, or this was a concert that we had by bees. Um, this was an event called the Confusatron. Um, and this ripped off this idea of sort of communities of interest, that we developed a project where we marketed it directly to four different communities in San Francisco. One was the food community, so we had kimchi making. One was the electronic music community, so we had this workshop on how to make electronic instruments out of cactuses. One was on the sort of gardening community, we had plant cloning. And one was on um, this sort of extreme form of drag makeup. It's very influenced by Leah Bowery, that's called uh, Tranimal. And the idea was that you would come and do a workshop like kimchi, and then you would wander over and get a really extreme makeover, and then later make a musical instrument out of a cactus. My name is Mark Allen. I was the director of Machine Project. I started in about eight years ago. From the very beginning of Machine Project, I'm very interested in how do you shift people's relationship to the things that constitute their work. Almost all aspects of our existence, you're always surrounded by things that were made by some crazy process that you have no understanding of. We did something called the Confusatron, and the idea of it is that we do a lot of workshops at Machine, which are popular but with draw kind of specific audiences. And so my thought with it was to bring together four different workshops that we had done that would kind of bring different kinds of people together. So we did electronics, plant cloning, tranimal makeup, which is a style of drag makeup, and kimchi. I think that that process of actually doing something yourself and making something yourself produces a different kind of relationship to the knowledge. It's not necessarily that there's a set body of information that every single person needs to get, but it's more about their engagement with the process. Part of the interest was to try and do something that wouldn't necessarily have a separation between performer and audience. There's people running the workshops, but it's kind of whoever is coming constitutes the piece. And I think we saw that work in a really dramatic way with the Tranimal stuff, because it's so theatrical. My name is Austin Young, and I'm one of the creators of the Tranimal workshop. And my name is Squeaky Blonde, and I'm one of the creators of the Tranimal workshop, also I'm an artist. And I think really, truly, it's about it's about like create creativity, like in the moment, you know. And it's like, hey, I, can, I can't even like express that enough because it's really like, we we set up a, a situation where where and you can could anything could happen, and it and it does, you know. And you give the space for it. 
and then people, uh, people who are participating are the ones who are, who are be, being the canvases for this process. I, start, I got my start doing uh, performance art and drag in San Francisco at this place called Tranny Shack. I sort of wanted to take, take uh, not necessarily stop doing regular drag, but, but start, I wanted to do something else. For me personally, in a, initially, like uh, I wanted to keep my beard and still and still have the pretty eyes and stuff, and and sort of keep that that like I always call it like a little guttery quality, kind of like dirty and kind of just using like, garbage and making something that's maybe like a costume that maybe will only get worn once and will only look good once because it'll be destroyed at the end of the night. And it's sort of just kind of evolved from that. We really, honestly, like had we had a couple of craft nights, and like we sat here and uh, we were making, I guess, um, goiters, just stitching goiters with. Um, we, we came up with the idea to go with goiters, and then we came up with the idea that we could, we could, we could change the shape of people's faces by um, adding, like you know, yeah, stuffing them like dolls, and then and then actually painting on top of it and using the nylon as a bit of a canvas. So that's the fun of it is using anything you find to make something interesting and beautiful. There's almost that childlike uh, playfulness of like being a kid and having craft night, you know, and but then like elevating it to like you can wear that to the club too. <laughs> did you guys dress up dress up as kids? Like, like I did, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we still do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna dress up so I'm the straight man. <laughs> Me too, bro. One of the really interesting conversations that's happening, I guess, everywhere in culture, but especially in museums, is like the idea of culture as a vertical hierarchy or as a horizontal hierarchy. And so the sort of extreme of the vertical hierarchy is like Western canon, where this like culture you're supposed to know and the job of education is to like impact it into your brain. And sort of the extreme of the horizontal culture is maybe like um, oh, I don't know, Facebook, where everybody's sort of putting stuff out there. And um, one of the things that I have been thinking a lot about is like, how do you produce work or experiences for people which kind of use the best aspects of that in the ways in which people, I think, very rightfully are interested in expertise or how we access other people's kinds of knowledge but are also interested in how they can relate and kind of experience culture. And I think we're in a cultural moment that's all right now about and. It's not or, it's all about and. The same thing is like maybe um, 10 years ago or five years ago as like internet communication and social media started growing. There's all these conversations about like People just want to live on the internet. They want to just do things in network communication. And I think much more now we see people are interested in how those two things feed each other. Like how do you connect back to the material through the virtual or use the virtual as a way to connect to the material. I think it's really interesting. You know, I was thinking about this because I was forced to teach like a media culture class at my college maybe eight years ago. And I had my students read art in the age of mechanical reproduction, just as like a reflex motion, the way like if somebody hits your knee, your leg goes up. And it's interesting to revisit that now and how it completely is not proved true. Like I spent the last three weeks going to look at every Piero della Francesca painting in Italy because my wife's obsessed with Renaissance painting and I kind of like it. And it's interesting how much we wanted to be in the physical presence of the um, and that's a lot of what my work is interested in. It's like, how do you produce lived experiences for people which are the presence of the moment remains really important to them? And sometimes I do that in a literal sense, and sometimes that becomes like a topic of conversation for it. Um, so with that very rambling segue, um, I want to show you another recent museum project we did, which is um, called the House Plant. Um, and then maybe I'll show you one more thing and then I'm going to steer off of there. <laughs> Thank you. 
here could be really nice for my plants. You know, the plant stays in one place all the time, and just a change of scenery might be really nice for the plant. Had you participated in other programs for plants before? Never. I had never, I had never taken my plant on vacation. <laughs> my plant had never really gone on a trip. This was called Houseplant Vacation, and the idea was to have people bring their houseplants to the museum for a month. And while the houseplants were there, we had different programming directed towards the plants. So everything from poetry readings to we brought a psychic in to do some psychic work with the plants, and we had music. I was really interested in what happens when you have a participatory piece. So there's an artist develops a project and you have uh, somebody participating in the project, but you also have this third audience, which are people who are watching the participation. And I got really interested in how, in those experiences, watching somebody participate in a piece, you're kind of imagining what it's like for them, or you're sort of imagining yourself in that role. And with the plant vacation, I was really interested in what would happen if you made a participatory piece where the participants were such an alien subjectivity that you couldn't imagine what the experience they were having was like and that you would be on the outside of that. seem like these three perfect words that when you get that in like the subject line of an email or you hear somebody saying that it like instantly conjures up some kind of image but the image doesn't explain the specifics of it or how it works and I think that's something that I like in that project is that the basics of bringing a plant to the museum for a vacation you kind of get but then the why and the how and what happens and what's the underlying discussion about that takes like a long time to unfold. for plants. It's like, oh, that sounds interesting. What is that? So what he does is he films honeybees pollinating flowers and then projects them onto plants with very high contrast. <laughs> and so we added that in halfway through the show and um, at night when no one was in the museum. It's really fun. It's really interesting having a curatorial practice which allows you to add stuff in in the middle. I was imagining like if halfway through like the Venice Biennial, I would call the curator and be like, oh man, I've got some work to be great for this. Can I just drop it off? <laughs> you don't see that as much as you might think. Um, so this idea that I've articulated a little bit of that in the idea of subjectivity is like a really core, simple idea that's in all my work. I'm always interested in like, how do we access other people's subjectivity? Can we access that? Where does that come together? Where does that break down? One of the things that I like about events, especially lectures, for example, like I noticed on the machine, the more boring the lecture we would have, the more people would come out. Like if we had a lecture on the history of uh, 
smelting lead. It would be like a packed house. And I think part of what's so exciting about that is like, if you get somebody who's really into the history of smelting lead, you can kind of see the world through their eyes. And that's a little bit like inhabiting somebody else's brain. That way that somebody else's enthusiasm or subjectivity becomes a pathway to what's amazing about the world is something I'm really excited by. Um, this video I'm going to show you, I'm just going to show you a little bit in the background, um, was another experiment with this. This was a project um, called Infant Core, and it was during this artist, Nate Page's project, where he took the front window of the gallery and moved it back 30 feet, so most of the gallery was this weird volume. And what we did is we invited people to bring their babies in and to dress them in primary colors. We then had a camera connected to a computer that could track their motion, and then map their motion to different variables for the sound piece that you're hearing. So for example, like maybe that blue baby is controlling the frequency of that beating, and maybe the yellow baby is controlling like, the pitch of another sound. And so from outside, like when you would walk by on the street, it looked like this sort of really sweet baby playpen. You couldn't hear the sound. But from inside of the gallery, it becomes this like weird, creepy alien suit. Where I imagine like aliens have come down and like collected a bunch of babies to display. It's like a human infant suit. So I, I, when I started the space, my thought of it was like a venue where people could come give talks. But then over time, people would come do things, and I really liked working with them. And then I developed these different kinds of collaborative relationships. And so it varies dramatically. Like maybe I meet you, and you're a genius. I'm sure you are. I can tell just from your vibe. And I'm like, OK, we're going to make this work happen. You don't need my creative input, but you need money. So we'll find some money. And maybe you're another genius and you also don't want my creative input, but you need some space, so I create like a setting. But other people uh, develop these kind of interesting collaborations with. So for example, this poet, Joshua Beckman, I work with. He writes poetry and publishes poetry books and does poetry readings like a normal poet. But we've been on a kind of 10-year project of really interrogating what is the mode of reception for poetry. Has anybody here ever been to a poetry reading? Yeah. I can tell you what it was like. There were probably between like five and 35 people. Each poet read for approximately 20 to 30 minutes. And afterwards, maybe you said hello to them for a second when they signed the book you were purchasing. Maybe not, but that's typically the form for it. But there's no particular reason why it has to be that form. So Josh and I did a project where he was trapped underneath the floor of the gallery. And he would read poems to one person at a time through a tube in the floor. <laughs> We did a project where we had three poets offshore on a sailboat, and you could signal them with a lantern, and they would call this phone that was on the shore and read you a poem. We did a poetry delivery service where you could call the gallery, and the poets would walk to wherever you were, read your poem, and walk back. A lot of these inspired by the poetry phone John Giorno's project. So some of the relationships I have with the artists are very collaborative. But they're all people who are kind of interested in what happens between humans, generally, 
how do ideas and knowledge circulate between people? What's performance? Like, I think performance is the weirdest thing in the world because it's something that we do, every one of us, in multiple manifest ways on a daily basis, but it's also like a formalized thing that we do as a way of articulating culture and culture. Right? So like, I'm performing Mark Allen, curator dude from LA who's giving a talk. You're performing that you're actually interested. Um, I'm sure when you go home to your partners or to your dogs or your cats, you're another different kind of person. I teach also, so I do this weird performance where I pretend like I care that my students are learning. Um, and this is all something that we just naturally do, we don't really think about. Um, but there's also this, I got fascinated just by watching friends of mine perform, where it would be before an event machine, and I'd be talking, and I was like, how's your day? Do you want a beer? How are things going? And then all of a sudden they would be singing, and they would be a completely different phenomenon. Like, the Emily Lacey that I knew as my friend was not there for the moment. This totally different phenomenon was there. And then they were back. And some people I knew just did it seamlessly. Like, they're talking, and then all of a sudden they're performing. And other people, like, go into, like, a cave, and then they can't talk to anybody afterwards. So I remain weirdly obsessed with what is performance. And so a lot of the stuff I do kind of investigates that. Um, and since I mentioned how I wouldn't do artwork for dogs and my interest in performance, I'm going to show you a short video about an opera for dogs. <laughs>
And what we're going to do is we're going to break those membranes of protein so that when these little pieces of fat hit against each other, they're going to form butter. Um, and that seemed very, to go over very well, but I think there's a long history of spiritualism here in the UK. We also did like a lie detector building workshop. It's like mind reading for the left and right brain. Um, and that seemed a little more California. I don't know. I mean, I think that, that LA in particular is an interesting place to be an artist because it's a big city with a lot of different kind of people that has relatively inexpensive commercial real estate that people can rent spaces temporarily for not a ton of money. It's also dominated by art schools, so you have a lot of people who are coming through. It's less dominated by the market than New York, for example. And it's a city where people's informal cultural productions play the dominant role in what's being talked about in the art world. And I think this is very confusing when people visit there, because it's one of those cities that if you just arrive there, it's kind of hellish. 
and it takes some access to what's underneath the surface. So in a way, like the work that I'm showing is a reflection of my sensibility, but it really is also part of a larger sensibility that feels West Coast to me. But I think one of the things that's, if I look at the work, that seems like a dominant characteristic is an interest in accessibility, right? Like it uses humor a lot. It is not afraid to have kind of dumb premises. And the idea is that the more interesting, deeper content is really underneath the surface, but you have to give people some entry to it. So that does allow it to travel. But I mean, you would probably be a better judge than I am if it seems irrelevant to you here in the United Kingdom, maybe my thesis is wrong. Not sure. Like, how does it feel? Yes. No, I was about to ask the audience if I was irrelevant, so please save me from that and ask a different question. Do businesses and innovators um, try to collaborate with you, or do you, do you work with sort of commercial enterprises in, in trying to help them establish prototypes or innovative ideas? Well, I think that there's a strong tradition of the art world or new media technology artists being like the, or the art world in general, being like the unpaid or semi-paid R&D product development wing of like technology. <laughs> and so of course there is some interest in that. As our work, our work which is less involving technology, much less so. Like occasionally you'll get someone who wants to be like, an innovation workshop or something like that, and I'll make up something ridiculous on occasion. Where we see that a ton is with museums. So we do a lot of work with museums, and we function in a certain way as like a research wing of how audience engagement is being developed for cultural spaces. Yeah, I was thinking about the sort of interdisciplinary model with MIT and stuff, and that seems a real great kind of seat there for great ideas once you yeah. kind of clash disciplines and Businesses are trying to provide some of your in my maverick thinking. My personal opinion is that those things are interesting when it's about novel ways to use technology and it's really market driven. The underlying kinds of ideas, like I'm interested in what other people's experience of the world is like and how to connect with people outside of necessarily an economy. It's not that interesting to companies as far as I'm concerned. Well, what, do you find that more here? I mean, you it's all are interested in this here to a certain degree, right? It's interesting because my post is funded by this EU project, which is all about trying to get artists and designers to work with scientists and innovators. Because the premise of this project is the idea that once you bring them both together, then brilliant innovations take place. Yes. <laughs> I have a controversial theory on the very interest of marrying art and science. And I'll share it with you guys. It comes from people's core uncomfortable feeling that art is useless because it doesn't really make money or save lives. And science has alienated people by being too disconnected from manifest good. So that a scientist or we might have a certain anxiety that like astrophysics has become too distant from making a widget that makes my life better, and so through the arts we're going to humanize science, and that art is a meaningless thing in society, and it's got to carry its weight, and so it's going to carry its weight by explicating science. That's my somewhat cynical, negative view on it. To put on my positivist hat, um, what I think, what I would argue for is actually the mission of both art and science are the most important things about being a human. So if we think of science as like a precise articulation and description of whatever reality is, it doesn't have to make money to be worthwhile. I think that in itself is a pretty intensely awesome thing to do. Secondly, if we think about art as an attempt to think expansively about what it means to be a human in a, like, a non-empirical way, I also think that's the other important thing we should be doing. So I actually think the only two things we should be doing is science and art, but um, not because they help each other make money for the culture in general. And you know what? It's about, it's about this idea of great innovation and the 
Okay, but why is innovation a good idea at all? What's so great about innovation? It's fun. It's fun. Because when it's fun, it helps us map what reality is, or it provides new ways for humans to relate to each other in interesting, productive ways. Which I would sort of come back to saying are the key goals of art and science. Other explanations why innovation is good, or a question from the back? Can you still hear me? Sorry, why do you have innovation? Absurdist. Yeah. There's two reasons for this. One is really basic. That's my sensibility. The things I find delightful, entertaining, funny, and I want my life to be entertaining, delightful, and funny. But it's also a way of creating a point of access. So when a human being encounters something that they don't understand, there's basically two primary reactions. One is like, ooh, I don't know about this, I don't belong here, I'm embarrassed, I shouldn't have come. Or, what is that weird thing over there, I want to look at that. So, making things kind of funny or light is a way to induce the second part of it, where, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, I'm just going to add that you're completely getting what I'm getting at, that the idea of funniness, the objection, the ridiculous, the masquerade, and it's so crucial to the definition of what human is. Throughout history, and they're kind of like the limits. Right. And I was wondering how that, yeah, that was what I was getting. Great. Um, and then the second part, the question about how the documentation functions, is something that I learned. The first five years I did Machine Project, I set a camera up on a tripod and I filmed the events. And then later I realized I had a hundred. 150 unwatchable videos because you could be at something which was so magical and intense and then you watch the video and it's just dead. So that you can't, a disembodied eye looking at something later isn't getting it. And so when you make the videos what you have to do is do like reconstructive surgery. So through editing and how you articulate it or a voiceover, you try and make like a parallel thing that conveys the same kind of idea. So I wouldn't say like you've seen the dog opera or the plant vacation. You've seen a different work which has some of the same ideas embedded in it and which attempts to convey like a sensibility fact. So I mean in terms of like the audience, like I think that I really like I'm personally super invested in being generous to my audience. So I don't think the pieces are meant to ridicule the audience. I think the people know they're watching an opera with dogs and it's ridiculous. I don't think they think that they're experiencing something other than what you're seeing. Yeah. I mean, who says the audience is entitled to protection anyway? 
What's that? I, I don't think an audience is, um, can justifiably expect to be protected from art. I don't think, you know, they don't, I don't think that matters if you upset people. Well, um, I guess that depends on if you're a modernist or not. So, like, modernism is really based on the idea of the avant-garde, that the artist's job is to shock the audience into new consciousness. But it doesn't have to be shocking either. It can just be entertaining. Not if you're a modernist. <laughs> so, I'm not a modernist. I think that I want to share interesting ideas with my audience, and so I need to be generous to them. Like, that doesn't mean you can't do things which are intense, or uncomfortable, yeah. right? Uh, but, yeah, exactly. but you want to do that in like a generous way. Yes, it, it, exactly. I mean, you can create apprehension or expectation. You can disappoint. You can upset people's expectations and turn things around. Yeah. It doesn't have to be always pleasurable. Well, I think there's different kinds of pleasure. Yeah. Like, I like thinking about shit. I can be really uncomfortable and enjoy thinking about shit. And actually, part of the reason I got interested in performance was that it's so uncomfortable. Like, some kinds of performance, you're like, oh my god, I cannot believe my physical body is in the room experiencing this. But you can then detach and observe yourself having that experience, and that's fascinating, yeah. right? So, like, one of the things that's great about static art is the opposite of that. You you, you know if you want to look at a painting in like four tenths of a second, and it's not forces you to look at it for a long period of time. Um, so I guess what I sort of think about my job as like a curator or a facilitator is I try to create a really well-made container that gives the audience enough framework to know what's going to happen to yeah. them, but not too much that it ruins what they're going to get. Oh, so like an example of this, I did a, another project at the Hammer Museum where we made a a theater for two people underneath the stairs, and you would be you would go into this theater and see a performance. And the performances were two minutes long, and that was the most important piece of information because people were not coming to the museum for the theater. They were coming to do other things, and I'd be like, Do you want to see a performance underneath the stairs? Mm -hmm. Right? That actually sounds horrible. But if I say to you, it's only two minutes long, presumably you're like, okay. How bad can it be? And so my job there is to give people just enough information that they have, they can make a decision about what kind of experience they have. Yeah. Another example of that is we did a reading with Eileen Miles. Um, actually, we may be at this point in the talk. You know, like if you go to a talk or a reading at like 48 minutes, you whether you want to or not, you start thinking like, okay, it's probably time for this to stop. How much longer can you go on? And you start to feel uncomfortable, right? So if it was a five hour talk, that would be horrible. But when you go to the opera, if you go to see like the ring cycle, part of it is like, it's five hours long, I'm an extreme opera fan, ah! Right, like, because you're proud for that, you're into that thing. So like, for example, we had a reading with Eileen Miles who wanted to read this entire piece from this Iceland book, it was gonna take two and a half hours long. So we tell the audience, this is gonna be a two and a half hour reading, you say that in the email, Feel free to leave if you want to. And then, of course, everybody, because they want to be extreme, they come and they stay and they go. That's just enough information. It doesn't mean you have to cut, I mean, talk to 15 minutes because people's short attention span. You have to position people. So, uh, that just made me self conscious. Maybe I've been talking too long. So, if you feel like, oh my God, I can't believe this is still going on. How about a five minute break? Because I've got lots more questions. Okay, that sounds good. Can we do a five minute break? Yeah. Have a break, get a drink. If you've been dying to leave, you can leave. If you want to chat some more, I have nowhere else to go. I have no friends here except for Duncan. Half an hour, 45 minutes. Okay? To give you some expectations. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Great. Five minute break. Thank you very much. Come in, come in. Okay. Um, I just wanted to start off by asking Mark um, about a little bit about kind of knowingness or non-knowingness. I remember when I went to see the, you at the Mark Film Festival, there was a really great performance by a guy that you brought in, but he did a performance that I had absolutely no idea what he was doing. Yeah. And I realized later that he was performing a pre-internet meme yeah. about that was come, came from a heavy metal concert. That I, be, I believe it's a British band, Venom. Yeah. Is Venom British? Nobody knows. I don't know. I didn't get those. No? Not British? Venom? Venom. 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 Okay. So how many people in that audience knew what that guy was doing? Um, well, I don't think, be, so the piece was, this guy Cliff comes on stage and he basically lip syncs 
this seven minute recording, which is just a ridiculous band, like collection of their most stupid stage banter. And so it's sort of a lip syncing, a musical performance, but it's this weird interstitial thing. And Cliff has a very expressive face, so there's something very funny about it. So yeah, I think probably some people, I think it's interesting when a work reveals itself during the thing, right? Like that you may not know what it is in the beginning, but it's structure teaches you how to look at it. Like I think all great artists like that, like it teaches you how to see it. So, but is your question about, does an audience need to know what's happening? Yeah, or? that's exactly that, yeah. I think an audience, we were just talking about this. Yeah, I think an audience deserves some framing, but I think you're ill served by trying to explain what's gonna happen to somebody before it happens. So I think it's a balance. I think you want to give people just enough information so they're at a thing they want to be at, right? Like if you're, if halfway through this talk I started trying to sell you timeshare condos in Laguna Beach, you would be unhappy because this was not what you were expecting, right? But that you maybe came without knowing very much about the work this was happening, right? But in Martha, was that specific to that audience, do you think? Or that would have been something you'd do anyway? I would do that piece anywhere. I think it's a very charming right. work, yeah. Okay, right. But I, you know, this is the question um, that you were asking, even though you were sitting somewhere else, so I got confused, about whether work functions in other places. I'm going back to this question, and I'm going to say you just do your thing wherever you are, and people will connect to it. It's just like this idea of curating or putting on events. I think of myself as like audience member number one. Like I program things that I'm interested in, and I just assume I have enough in common with other humans. We got the same hardware, probably somewhat similar software that people will connect to it. Mm. So I think that our audience. Maybe if I did a project in another country or another culture, maybe I would get a different audience, but there would be somebody there who was interested. I would hope. I think it's a bad strategy to try and change what you do to match a different and once impression people, of what people want. Once people start working with Machine Project, do they kind of continue? Is that a... Um, yeah, typically, yeah. Sometimes your creative work intersects for a certain period of time and sometimes it continues in parallel. I think it's like sometimes you're friends with somebody for a long time and sometimes for a short time and it's not a tragedy. Maybe you're just thinking about the same thing at the same time. But most of my relationships are ongoing curatorial relationships. And actually, this is a real interesting thing you can only do if you're an alternative state. If you're a museum, you can't really do a giant show with the same artist every year. You'd be like, all right, move along. And if you're a commercial gallery, once your artist becomes successful, they move to Gagosian or something. And so what's interesting about my practice is that I work with artists who are, a few of them, commercially successful. And it's not threatening to the existing infrastructure, so I can kind of keep working. And I'm interested in iterative approaches to thinking in general. So rather than one thesis which is proved in a certain moment more than an idea emerges or develops just like a photograph does. So part of working with you for a long period of time is you can have a more in-depth conversation. How long did it take to establish the project to be where you are now? How long has it been running? It changed a lot. I started in 2003 and um, from 2003 to 2005 it was very much a venue. So people did things one night, etc. Out of that, I would say after a couple years, I started developing these more ongoing relationships with artists. And in 2008, um, we did a large-scale project at um, the Los Angeles County Museum, curated by Charlotte Cotton, who lives here now, she's a photography curator. And that started a long period of museum work, which was like another real shift. Um, and then the other big shift I think that's happened in the last three years is a deep interest in documentation. So video production and interviews has become a really important part of what I do. Um, and so 10 years total, probably about two or three years to become a nonprofit, and another five years to develop this model where we do things out of our storefront space. Mm -hmm. 
And what's the next thing? Um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think that we're interested in, you know, like if you were running a nonprofit space or and 20 years ago, your growth model was infrastructural. Like, mm -hmm. oh, we're a successful small nonprofit, let's get a giant warehouse space for you to make your shows. Now, of course, that seems insane, right? So growth models are primarily, you're either a giant, like the biggest museum in the world, you're the Tate, so let's build like eight more buildings, or you're tiny and you see, like me, you see infrastructure as a limitation, and so your growth model is relational. So basically where we are now is figuring out how to work in other places by having other kinds of relationships. And I'm not sure if that's gonna work for us or not because it's easy for me to put a project together in LA if all my collaborators live there. It's very hard for me to put together a project in Korea if I like working with 20 people at a time. Yeah. Right, it becomes very expensive. And also people have jobs they can't pick up and go somewhere necessarily. Would you work with diverse demographic in LA or is it kind of a sort of alternative art crowd or into um, Yeah, I'd see it as pretty diverse. And I would say that if you randomly sampled the people who come to our things, they wouldn't self-identify as artists. I mean, many of them would, but if you're, but I'm, I'm pretty much interested in a much broader section of what humans do. Um, and my interest in art is really as like, it's the really open space in our culture. And it's a really interesting framework for thinking about stuff. You know, like, and that's how I think about it. Like, the way that you could take David, the sculpture, and be a geologist and analyze it as a geologist. Be like, oh, well, this marble comes from here, and it has to do with this formation period, and completely ignore the aesthetic level on it. I like to do the opposite. I like to hear what a geologist is interested in and look at it from questions that artists traditionally might be interested in, like subjectivity, the meaning of reality, um, questions about like politics and society. And do you um, engage with we who don't necessarily have the luxury to, to assume that art is a space for thinking? Do you, um, do, you, do you move out of, I mean, do you work with different communities or any kind of different engagement that isn't necessarily yeah, yeah, this is a good question because I realized I didn't articulate myself very well. That's the context I use because that's a useful tool for me, like thinking about art in this framework. But it's not the way we might articulate stuff to people. The way we articulate stuff to people is like, I met this geologist, he seems fascinating, come by, he's going to talk about what he does. So in that way, it's not really directed exclusively towards people from an art discourse. But that's present in it. And the idea with the work is always to have a bunch of levels. So most people who experience something like the plant vacation are not interested in like how subjectivity is mirrored in performance or participatory work. And they don't experience it that way. They see it as sort of light or fantastical or delightful or just sort of charming which is great, I want to give people that level of access to it. But of course, for me, I have other questions underneath that I'm interested in that one can access if that's something you're interested in talking about. Um, you know, yeah, that's my answer. Did that answer your question? Uh, kind of. Did you have a follow-up? Or your friend does? You'll do well, follow-up. Well, I was just thinking, following on from that, this, it's just interesting what your role is, because obviously through the films, that you could view those very much as entertainment, but you've been talking about these different multiple levels that it comes, you know, you can access that work upon. Yeah. So is it is your role very crucial in a way as almost a translator in terms of like invigorating discussion or questions around the framing of those events or why we're in this on or those kinds of questions? Well, I think the hope is that the videos and I showed you a number that I was the narrator of, but sometimes the artist narrator are the people narrate. So you might have gotten a slightly skewed version of my usefulness. Um, I think that the idea is that the video should embed that in it. In other words, it shouldn't require an explicator, just as the events themselves shouldn't require an explicator to say why it's interesting. The projects are meant to function as themselves. And that, you know, maybe I can be a guide to my personal thinking about it, and that may be or may not be interesting to you, but I don't see it as essential to the work. I think my role is to provide psychic energy for it all to happen. Right? So 
like that's every project needs some energy field in the middle of it or it won't happen. So I do that for that reason. Do you, can I ask a really important question? Yes, oh my god, please. Yes, that's a good question. It's horrible. Um, <laughs> you guys, I suspect, are being shoved brutally a little bit more towards the American model, where there's very little state support of the art. It's very unpleasant, and I don't approve of it. Um, so our budget's about $250,000 a year. We're sort of a mid-sized to small arts organization. We get approximately 65% of it from grant support, of which only about 10% is state. The rest is private foundations. I actually think the funding model for experimental art in the future is dead rich artists. So I'm very involved with the Andy Warhol Foundation. They fund us. We get funded from the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation. One of the things the Warhol Foundation has been very involved with is working with living artists to help them set up foundations to support the arts. And it's this weird, you know, like the art world's a pyramid. There's not a lot of, there's a lot of people doing it. There's very little money concentrated into a very small portion of people. And that ends up hopefully circulating back in this weird fashion. Um, the rest of the money comes from membership people. We convince them to give us money. How much is the membership? $50 to $100 roughly. Okay, and what's the get from get that? A hug. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> hug, discount on classes, first access to stuff. Like, I'm really interested in work for very small audiences, and so sometimes our things sell out in like a minute. Literally, so members get first access to those things. Okay, because I mean, we're, we're kind of thinking that we've, that's something that we have to go down that model as well, but it's... It is the hardest way to make money because you need to establish a personal relationship with every single person. Whereas when you write a grant, you need to establish a personal relationship with one grant officer. Mm -hmm. So the dollar to effort ratio is much different. But it's, it's kind of, if someone can't afford the membership and then can't get access, I mean, creates a barrier if you create a hundred dollar membership, which probably equates to hundred dollars here. It means that everyone would book only the members would get You obviously didn't friends. just come here with American money and turn it into pounds. I do, I do, because I, I, I imagine your rates are much cheaper. So I, anyway, the point is, and if that's something that I've been thinking about, I think it will create a barrier between Well, the major, majority of our events are free. So um, I don't see membership is explicitly the enfranchising. It becomes a way for people to contribute. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think coming from a society where there's no support from a state level for the arts, people have to understand that without some support, it's just not going to happen. And so you kind of need to give people a way to do that. So I, I don't see this as yeah, it's just interesting. It's just interesting how you go about it. Yeah. And then there's also like the individual donor part, where it's like, mm -hmm. I know you've been following our work for a long time. I love what you did founding Facebook. We're doing this new project with Cliff Hanks. I'm trying to raise $40,000. I'd like to ask you if you could donate $20,000 today. So you do that, which is horrible, but I do. But honestly. you say you actually get access to rich people. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> it's a little bit difficult because our actually, with a more traditional art space which deals with art which would go into the market, it's much easier because there's a whole ecosystem, right? Like the museum trustees also collect the artwork that's shown at the museum, showing the art at the museum, increases the cultural capital, the cultural capital turns into real capital, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. But I can access at least people have jobs. So I'm not asking people really for 20000 but I might ask them for $1,000. And then projects we do with institutions, we take a percentage of the budget as a fee. That was a longer answer maybe than you wanted. <laughs> felt like I had to go through. Also, here's the shocking thing. I have a job. So I teach at a college, so I'm not an employee per se of the gallery. It's just my weird, completely compulsive, over-involved hobby. So part of the funds that would pay for a director, I'm subsidizing basically by working at my job. But I like my job. So the way of moving forward might be to have the Well, it's a really interesting question because um, there is a deep urge culturally to quantify and systematize everything. 
And in the nonprofit funding world, it's like this too. The funders are looking for a model that it will then they want to replicate. So in the United States, a great example, this is Project Row Houses. Is anybody familiar with this organization? Fantastic project started by Rick Lowe in Houston. He purchased a bunch of these row houses, which are very poor housing in a very poor community, and has slowly over time turned both into an arts residency and low-income housing development model. So everybody in the nonprofit world is like, oh, everybody just do what Rick did. It's going to be great. It'll change everything. And people have tried to do it in other places, and it's not worked. And the reason for it is that alternative spaces and social practice and artist practices are like plants. Like, if you have a really lovely house plant in your flat here in London and you bring it to LA, within like 20 minutes it's going to be like, I'm in hell, there's no water in the air, I think I'm going to die now. And in fact, cultural practices are like that in a certain sense as well. So I'm interested in this idea of examples. Like you can learn a lot from a successful example, but I'm skeptical of the model or the franchisement or the idea that one thing because in a way, like, L Machine Project is a response to what LA kind of, I felt like was missing in LA. You don't want to go somewhere and be like, you guys are missing the same thing they are in LA. You might be missing something completely different. Well, exactly, but that's how it would work. That's why the, you need the right person in each of those places to be doing it. You did have, I understood the human, so the access policy is the same, but they would be different. But you know, everywhere I go, there are places like, I mean, I'm in a version of Machine Project right now. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's not, I mean, it's interesting, do you see, which organizations do you have an influence with? I think you're saying South and Europe. Uh, or close in, aligned to maybe what you're doing? I am going to pass on that question because of my ignorance of what's going on in Europe. Okay, or around the world. I can only talk about it. <laughs> I can talk about the United States. Yeah, sure. I'm sorry, I would like to know more what's going on here, but... No, it's, it's fine. Um, but maybe at the end of this week, in the book. Uh, the United States, I really like Cabinet Magazine, yeah. which is in New York. We sh I really admire their sensibility. Yeah. And there's a space called um, Elsewhere Collective in North Carolina. Is anybody familiar with this space? This was a... This, this guy's grandmother had an enormous thrift store. It was like multiple buildings, and when she died, she left it to him. And so he inherited these buildings and 100,000 spools of thread and like 5,000 pairs of shoes. And he's constructed this really interesting art residency where people come and the, I, the premise is nothing enters and nothing leaves. So people come and continually remake the space out of stuff. <laughs> Um, my real inspirations in LA are the Museum of Jurassic Technology and the Center for Land Use Interpretation. Um, and we do very different things, but I was very interested in their model of how they inhabit cultural forms. Like the Museum of Jurassic Technology inhabits the form of a natural history museum as a way for David to explore all these ideas. And I was sort of thinking about could I inhabit the form of like an art gallery to investigate some of the Uh, I teach in the art department at Pomona College, and my focus is on graphic design and experimental performance. Yep. Is <laughs> well, <laughs> well, actually, we do a lot of graphic design machine project because I'm interested in poster design as a form of documentation because it has so much metadata in it. So if you look at like punk rock flyers from LA, or invitations to conceptual art shows in New York, you learn as much from the aesthetic of the design as you do from the work. And so we've done a project where we do posters for many of our events. We have hundreds of them. And I, it's actually a really interesting document of where a design sensibility in the city is at a specific point. So Mark, how do you go with maintaining energy levels with a job and a sort of psychic energy field for <laughs> huge and diverse projects. Is that a strain or is that? Um, I think that the strains are worrying about money for the gallery because that's a struggle. And then trying to, you know, when you start something, it's very easy because you just do what you want. Whereas once you have momentum, you also have inertia. And so there's a lot of unconscious pressure to just do things that you've done before. 
And then you, I feel like, is this a job? I'm not being paid to do this job. Why am I doing this? And so the struggle for me is feeling like, is this relevant? And is this personally kind of what I want to do? And then the other thing is you grow as an organization and you have employees and staff and all these artists you're working with. It becomes, you have to confront a certain question, which is like, is this always what I want to do? Or how do I allow other people's needs to impact kind of what we do? And the way we try and deal with that is we say we don't do anything unless somebody really wants to do it. It doesn't have to be me, it can be somebody else, but somebody has to own everything. But we still do stuff all the time. You do that, you do that, you, de you deny, you reject 99 things you don't want to do, and there's still occasionally something like, why are we doing this? Nobody here is excited about this, this sucks. So the sort of psychic struggles that are a drag, um, I mean, I don't have any wisdom other than it's what I, my, it's where my creative work manifests, so that's why I do it, right? But I think being a human is terribly hard for everybody, right? <laughs> I mean, you have to make money, the world is tragic, you have to have relationships with other people, you know, <laughs> you're gonna die, it's like, fuck, oh, man, it's heavy. Yeah. Maybe that's a good point to end it on. <laughs> Mark, Mark, you still haven't answered my question about the trap door. Oh. What was the question? To describe it? Yeah. Why is the trap door iconic in your work? Well, because, and I, there's some other video where I talk about this a little bit. When you are a child, your parents do not let you do the things you want to do. And when I was a child, I wanted to build secret passages into our house. And um, when you're an adult, you can do whatever you want. And so I rent the space, but my landlords are never there. So nothing gives me greater pleasure than cutting a hole in the floor. So I build a variety of bizarre secret passages. And we're doing, when I get back, we're making a very elaborate haunted house, which is removing part of the floor. So I don't know if it has a real strong conceptual explanation, <laughs> but it's very much like, um, what I enjoy doing. And also I think part of my practice is about just shifting variables. Like I look at a situation, I say, what's one variable I can shift? If we do a performance, instead of for people, we do it for plants, what happens? And so at Machine, we've done 1,500 events, literally. You run out of variables, and so you start being like, can we remove the floor? Can we remove the wall? Can we move the front window? What happens if we fill it with kittens? And so it becomes part of the iteration through of all possible variables like a lazy computer program. That's like my territorial approach. Mm -hmm. Change this, try that. Yeah. yeah. Well, y'all are such a sweet and welcoming audience. Thank you so much for your time. If you're in LA, come check us out, machineproject.com. I'm giving an identical but more boring talk at the ICA <laughs> on Friday at 3. If you felt like you missed something, feel free to see me again there. Come <laughs> on, Thank you very much. Thank you.